title is we've been talking about how to take kids who come into this world very much as passengers in life I mean that's just the nature of things they're not the decision makers they're not the drivers they're not the ones in control they're just always the passengers that are getting carted around by mom and dad how do we be become really intentional about transitioning our kids from sort of the back seat of life where others are making the decisions for them others are deciding what they'll do how they'll spend their time what they'll do with with their days how do we get them transitioned to a place of being decision makers and leaders that make really sound decisions and so today and next week as we wrap this up we're going to be unpacking one little verse of scripture it's intriguing to to realize that Jesus life which has defined redefined and changed all of human history that we only really get about three or three and a half years of his life unpacked in the Gospels and beyond that all we get is a snapshot by two of the writers of his birth and then we get this one quick little Polaroid shot so to speak of Jesus at age 12 when he goes to the temple and other than that it's just boom he's 30 years old and he's going public with his ministry and we know so little about this whole thing of the baby Jesus being a child, being an adolescent, and the tremendous task of Mary and Joseph raising the Son of God. Moms, how many of you would sign on for that? Okay, I, I know half of you looked at your children when they were infants as if they were the sinless sons and daughters of God. but. Uh How, how did they go about this? And, and the gospel writers are essentially silent on this. About the only thing, thing we're given other than this one little account of Jesus going to the temple when he's 12 years old is Luke just tells us in Luke 2.40 that the, the child, Jesus, grew to be physically strong. And he grew in wisdom. And then when we get to the very end of Luke 2, in, in Luke 2.52, we're given this one verse that summarizes what takes place during these childhood and adolescent years where Luke sums it up by saying Jesus grew both in body and in wisdom gaining favor with God and people and in that one little line he spells out at least four major areas of development that were taking place in Jesus life which serve for us like a template of the different areas that we've got to be careful as parents to make sure that we're staying focused and bringing our kids up being very intentional about what we're training them to do in each of these four areas he says you know Jesus grew up physically he, he grew strong and it reminds us that there is physical development and maturation that we've got a role to play in that and and we read that Jesus grew in wisdom he was he was growing intellectually he, he was developing his mind and his emotions and Jesus grew in favor with God that there was definite spiritual de development that needed to be done by his parents and then the final piece he grew in favor with men and that's the whole relational piece that Jesus was good at relationships and my intention when I set out was to talk about all four of those today and I just absolutely can't do that once I got the sermon developed I realized it was two sermons worth of material so the fourth one which is huge uh, it is an entire sermon unto itself that's next week and you don't need to miss next week here for some of you who are like I'm not a parent or my kids are grown and gone hey next week I will just tell you it's coming under the under the heading of a parenting series but you're gonna see when we get into next week when we talk about relationships we're all gonna look at that and go oh yeah I need to teach that to my kids and grandkids but maybe first and foremost I need to learn that for myself as we talk about how to do relationships well how to set healthy boundaries how to do relationships where you don't get jacked up along the way how to do life-giving relationships so we're gonna set the fourth piece aside for next week and today we're gonna home in on those first three things that Jesus developed in that Mary and Joseph invested in Jesus life and talk about how do we do this as parents and the first one is simply this that we see that as Jesus developed physically when we talk about what are our roles as parents in preparing our kids for life the first one is this that children need to be trained in good health habits now that's not one you you expect to hear
observation of things. Two of these three, we are, in American culture, we're not doing well as parents, and, and one of the three I think we're still doing pretty well, but if we're going to train our kids well in terms of how they take care of their bodies and, and set themselves up for success long-term physically, three things that we need to, to teach them about. And the first one is just learning to eat a balanced diet. Yeah, you, you didn't expect to come to church and hear about uh, diet on Mother's Day, did you? But, but it's the truth. But listen to this passage. that is that today one in three children and adolescents are overweight according to the CDC and everybody else who studies this one in three and here's the really disturbing thing about that that percentage is triple what it what it was in the 1970s now let me chase this rabbit for just a minute stay with me on this three times the rate of being overweight or obese of what it used to be in the 70s and think about today versus the 70s I mean, today when you go in a fast food restaurant and you order the Happy Meal or whatever, you know, would you like apple slices instead of fries? You go to Wendy's, you know, as your side on your, your combo, you know, would you like a side salad? We've got all these healthy alternatives. We've got, all, you know, the organic section in the grocery store. Everything is so health conscious and, and modern medicine has advanced. I mean, we, we have all these things going for us and yet in terms of our actual health, we're going downhill rapidly. In fact, uh, a former Surgeon General of the United States recently came out and said that he believes that we are on the verge of watching for the first time in American history a generation that is coming behind us, this is our kids and our grandkids, who will live more unhealthy and shorter lives than those of their parents and grandparents because of two things, he says their diet and their lack of exercise. We have become a culture that though we have access to all of these things that are good and knowledge about them, that we don't practice the basic health habits that would set us up for success and good health. I mean, like the point I was just making, you go to the fast food restaurant and you've got access to all this good stuff. I mean, how many of you in the 70s had access to that? Man, when we went to the restaurant in the 70s, the only option you had to go with your double cheeseburger was fries, right? And you chase that with a Frosty. And that was a good day. You know what the difference was? We did it once a week. That's how it was at my house. Sunday dinner was usually the one chance to get to eat out. And if it was a good Sunday, we went to Wendy's. <laughs> That's the truth. And that was our one time in a normal week to eat out. Which is a reflection of how much things have changed. That we live in a time where the, the pace of life and family life is such that, you know, both mom and dad are working. Nobody wants to fool with cooking. And so we just eat out all the time. And kids don't learn healthy eating habits. Now, there's another piece in this, I'm convinced, that, that just is a huge part of the equation that's messing us up. And it is something that we're just missing as parents. And that is, we have to train our kids how to take care of themselves and how to eat right, just like we have to train them in everything else related to following Jesus. C.S. Lewis, who is one of, was one of the brightest Christian minds of the last century, if not the last several centuries, he said this about how we eat and what we want to eat. He said that he believed that what we crave in terms of food is a reflection of the fall. I mean, think about it. Who taught you to love candy, sugar, chocolate, Every, you know, who taught you to love Krispy Kreme donuts? So we, we, nobody had to train you in that, did they? We were born loving the junk. But we weren't so much born loving broccoli and carrots and Brussels sprouts. I mean, you may say, oh, no, I've always loved those things. Probably not. You may think you did, but if you do love them, your mama probably taught you to love them. 
I agree with him. He said, you know, when everything was as it should be in the garden before the fall, he said, I truly believe that mankind craved the things that were good for us. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? If broccoli just turned you on like a chocolate sundae. If you got as much pleasure out of eating a plate full of vegetables as you do going to Krispy Kreme and getting a dozen hot now glazed donuts. He said it's just a reflection of the fall that our wanters are broken. We want the things that are rotten for us. That the way we were originally made, mankind would have wanted the right stuff. And so it's a reflection of the fact that we've got to be retrained to learn to do the things and take in the things that are good for us. That's a part of the brokenness and fallenness of man that we've got to be re retrained in this. And I'm just going to make one final observation and move on. It's weird and kind of scary how many kids that you'll encounter now who are teenagers who eat, I mean, just spastic, retarded diets. That, that you can't even call it a diet. I mean, how many teenagers that, that you'll hear about now that their parents will say, well, all they'll eat is peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, so they just eat that all the time. All he'll eat is macaroni and cheese, so that's all can, I can ever cook for him is mac and cheese. Or, you know, all they do is pizza. They just eat pizza every day because that's, that's the only thing they like. To those parents, I want to go, are you kidding me? Do you think that's about your child? Because you're smoking crack if you think so. That's about you. You didn't train your child over the long term to eat the right stuff. I think about so many things that when I was a kid, I thought tasted terrible, and now I'll tear it up. Some of that's because I just got older and fatter, but part of that is that I had parents who taught me for 18 years, hey, if it's cooked and it's put on the table in front of you, you eat what is put before you. By the way, that's just good manners. Somebody prepares a meal, you eat what's put in front of you. To do less than that is rotten manners and shame on any parent who doesn't teach their child that. You eat what's put in front of you. Parents, going back to the basic thing, get a little bit of everything. I know you may not like that. Eat some of it anyway. I, in my family, when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. My parents did better later in life, but we, we, things were pretty meager growing up. So we had rice a lot. I hated rice. My dad was the king of one-liners, and I don't think he was a big fan of rice, but his one-liner was about rice was, rice is nice. He, <laughs> so, you know, every time. I don't care if you like it, eat some of it. I now love rice. I mean, I can't tell you how many things are like that. They're just, you, you got a little bit of it on your plate and you ate some of everything. Teaching our kids a balanced diet and with that, making sure that they exercise regularly. Proverbs speaks to stuff like that. We work hard will. Boy, that's a great lesson to teach our kids, isn't it? Lazy people do not get what they want in life, but those who work hard, those are the ones who do. A trap that many of us have fallen into as parents is we want so desperately to give our kids, quote, a better life than what we had, right? How many of us have either said that or thought that? I just want my kids to have a better life than what I had. And we'll think that that's what we're doing by giving our kids an easier life than what we had instead of a better life. And there's a world of difference. The easy life can be spent always in air conditioning, always on the couch, always accessing video games and TV and potato chips and you know just the junk of life and never having to do anything that's hard. And kids will love you for it. Never make them work. Never make them eat anything they don't want to. Never make them do anything unpleasant. And you're... A super parent until you told me I have to do something I don't want to and then you suck. You're terrible. You can't say that in church, can you? Sorry about that. Well, you're bad. That wasn't in the sermon notes. But you all know what I'm talking about. You're just, you're, you're bad because you made me do something hard. And so the lesson in that is, let's don't ever make them do anything hard. Parents, we are screwing our kids up if we don't make them work. I mean, a big part of this thing of the Surgeon General saying, they're going to die younger and live more unhealthy unless we change something. He said, because we don't teach them to eat right and we don't make them exercise. Hey, I'm not telling you you got to go make your kids run laps every day. The best thing that we could do is have them participate in physical work. And to supplement that with some, you know, rigorous activity. All of us, kids and adults, need at least four to five days a week that we get out and do something that jacks up our heart rate for at least 30 minutes at a time. 
So whether that's playing soccer, basketball, dancing, or cutting the grass, or weeding the flower bed, or whatever, just to get busy doing something active, this is a significant part of our role as parents. And it's Mother's Day, so we're just going to jump on it with both feet. We've got to teach them to eat right. We've got to keep them active. And then the third piece, it's the one that I think we still probably do well. It's the one that we seem to focus on pretty well still. And that is getting enough rest. Getting at least 9 to 10 hours of sleep every night. By the way, very biblical. The need for rest, and it goes all the way back to creation. God modeled for us. God didn't get tired creating the world, by the way. He was modeling for us the balance of life, that we need rest, that he rested from his labor. He designed us to need to spend about a third of our lifetime resting. And to fail to do that really throws us off. As adults, it throws us off. Man, it'll throw off your relationships and your productivity and everything if you don't get the rest that you need. And I, I know, I saw people chuckling when I said 9 to 10 hours. Let, let's get the numbers right. For preschoolers, the number is way above 10 hours per 24 that they need of sleep. Uh, elementary age kids, kindergarten up to about 5th or 6th grade, they need 10 to a little over 10, maybe as much as 11 hours of rest. And the number goes down the older they get. Middle school and high school... Again, these are the numbers from the CDC and everybody else who writes on sleep. Uh, middle school and high schoolers need 9 to 10 hours of sleep. Adults, boy, this is where we really get, get fouled up. Because we hear adults, it's like you're a weakling if you actually admit to getting the amount of sleep that your body needs. So like, you know, if you're a hard-working American, you should get by on 6 hours of sleep. And we love you even more if you can do it on 4 or 5. You're an idiot if you do. That's what you are. And you're probably miserable to live with because you're always underrested. It's, it's just true. The human body, the adult human body, needs seven to nine hours of sleep every night. And even one night of getting less than seven to nine hours, it is proven, will, will cause you uh, mood problems and it will cause you real concentration problems. And if you get multiple nights per week that you get less than that, it really causes major problems. There, I mean, research bears this out. Very few people can survive and do well on less than seven hours of sleep per night. And virtually everybody who can do less than that, six to seven is the absolute minimum that you can function and do well. Anything less than that, you're killing your body. You, you're, you're not just making yourself miserable. You're actually doing damage to your body. You're kicking in your adrenal glands, which is producing something that in the very short run can make you outrun the bear that's trying to kill you. And so it's, it's a win in that regard. But if it produces that in your body long term, it's a toxin. It actually poisons you long term. And it does all kinds of lasting damage. And trying to live on less sleep than that forces you to, to live constantly in that kind of state and eventually adrenal fatigue sets in which is all, all creates all kinds of other problems long and short the word was clear get the rest that you need God designed you that way he could have made you a perpetual motion machine so that you never had to get sleep he did not do that he made you with a need for about a third of the time spent in rest teaching our kids to do that is worthwhile so wow we've talked 20 minutes about taking care of your body teaching your kids to take care of their body enough said about that just consider this one of four major areas as a parent for us to nail. We've got to teach our kids to eat well, which probably along the way is going to mean we have to cook more. Or else we're going to have to be real careful what we do in the restaurants to be physically active and to get the rest they need. The second area that he talks about Jesus grew in is Jesus grew in wisdom. How do, you, how do you help a child develop wisdom? Because that's not just about head knowledge. That's not, you, you don't get that by going to public school. Wisdom is about having the kind of understanding that allows you to do life well, to make decisions well, to do relationships well. So where do, where do you get wisdom from? Well, we could appropriately say that as we teach our children character and sound values, they'll grow in wisdom. The wisdom is... your choices and your habits. Now everybody in the room, everybody watching and listening online would agree, I want to be a person of character. Every grown up that has a healthy functioning mind, you know, wants to have good character and we tend to think of ourselves as having good character, but here's the thing that begins to measure your character. It is the it is expressed through and measured through your habits 
and your values. So let's think for a minute about that. You know, when you think about your habits, it, it's been said, and probably rightly so, that we all spend somewhere around th the first 30 years of our lives developing the habits that we're going to live by, and the last 50 to 60 years of our life just doing the habits that we learned when we were growing up. And that's pretty much true, isn't it? That, that you get ingrained in you in the first 30 years of life, the stuff that's just going to sort of be the autopilot, the automatic default setting that you're going to live the last 50 or 60 years of your life on. So the habits that we set now are critically important and the choices that we make. Now we all are going to make some rotten choices. And it's easy to go, oh, well, I just messed up. I shouldn't have done that. I know I, know I shouldn't have done that. that, that that's not who I am. Hey, when, when you do that the first time, you can say that. When you do it the second time, it may still be true. But when you continue to make those same kind of rotten choices again and again, it's not, oh, that was just a mistake. No, that's your character. Because your character is the combination of, of habits and choices. Solomon said in Proverbs 11, 5, Moral character makes for smooth traveling. So here's the $64 question. How do you instill godly character, moral character, in the lives of your children. Helen Keller, who is one of the most striking figures in modern history, I mean, surely, I'm hoping, younger generation in the room knows who Helen Keller was, who in spite of total blindness and deafness, accomplished so much in life. She said this, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Now I'm going to go back and say that first line again. Parents, this needs to sink in for us. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. If it can't be developed in ease and quiet, then what's the implication of that? It's going to take difficulty. It's going to take pain. It's going to take some adversity. It's going to take some unfair treatment for character to be developed. This ain't going to be fun, this part. But this is the real deal. Our kids cannot learn godly character unless some, some bad things bump up against them in life. Amen. They're going to have to be treated unfairly to learn godly character. They're going to have to be done wrong there are some times where they're going to have to get what they didn't deserve in terms of bad stuff and didn't get what they did deserve in terms of good stuff. They're going to have to have those experiences in order to learn character. Because when life is easy and everybody's giving you a trophy just for showing up and getting out of bed and brushing your teeth in the morning, you don't learn character by that. You learn character when you get done wrong and you continue to do the right thing in spite of it. Character is learned through difficulty. Well, where does that apply to us as parents? Well, for everybody who's a helicopter parent, you know what I'm talking about. We're just hovering. We're hovering over our kids, waiting to swoop down and rescue them every time they get in trouble. We're going to rescue them from that bad, mean, mean teacher who's just always out to get them. I just can't believe why they treat Junior that way. Teachers are just all so bad today. Could it be? Could it just possibly be that Junior was born in sin, that he screws up, that he acts up, and that he needs the hammer to come down every now and then? Could it be? It could. And you know what? Sometimes Junior didn't act up. Sometimes Junior didn't deserve it. And you know what? The fact that he got rubbed the wrong way and sometimes done wrong and mistreated, he still doesn't need to be rescued by you and me. He needs to learn godly character that is developed in the real world where sometimes you get mistreated. Sometimes the world doesn't give you a big hug and a pat on the back and affirm you that you're good. Sometimes the world is mean to you. It wasn't all that sweet to Jesus. And the scripture is very clear. That he became perfect as he suffered adversity. 
We've got to stop rescuing our kids and looking at the world as if everybody is against our kids and trying to go in and fight the teachers and fight the principal and fight everybody else's parents. Why don't we go back to letting other people's parents help us to raise and discipline our kids? Let them feel the rub of the whole neighborhood watching them. Being able to correct them. Not being so afraid that somebody might say something that might damage their self-image, their self-esteem. Do you realize this is a fact? We are today, the modern world is the only time in history that anyone can, can find that any culture in the history of the world ever worried about self-esteem. How interesting is that? Go back and think about that one. No people in the history of the world, in terms of anything that ever got written down, were ever worried. I'm not saying self-esteem doesn't matter, but they were never worried about it. And it becomes like our ultimate deal for our kids. We don't want anything to damage their self-esteem. What we need is for the world to just do what the world does, to knock some rough edges off and to teach our, our kids to be strong and resilient and to learn how to love and forgive in spite of difficulty that comes their way. To learn how to hang in there and to continue to press on through that. I will never forget when Whitney, my oldest, was 18 years old and we went for the, uh, the final part of college orientation. It, you know, it, it was that moment where we were carrying her you know, four hours away from home to go off to college and stand on her own two feet. And many of you have been that down that road. You know what that feels like. I will never forget. There's one talk that they do where they take the 18-year-olds and they go do something else with them. And they just get the parents in the, this one theater there on the, the campus. And I mean, they, it is the... ...and to step out onto this campus... And they're going to have some great experiences and they're going to learn a lot. But they're going to have some problems. They're going to get into some trouble. They're going to run into some things that they don't know what to do. And I mean, they were just so blunt. They said, and you stay out of it. You leave them alone. You let them learn to be adults. You let them learn how to solve problems. But some of you who've spent the last 18 years fixing everything for your kids and going in and rescuing your kids, back off and leave them alone. I wanted to stand up and cheer. It's like, thank you for just telling us as parents, kids have got to learn to stand on their own two feet. I know when they're three years old and seven years old, they can't do that in all circumstances. But, you know, the long and short of it is, Character is learned in the difficult experiences of life. A second thing we'll say about character, and we'll move on, character and values, is kids will learn most of their values from three things, and they all involve you as parents. From watching how their parents treat people, watching how their parents spend their time, and watching how their parents spend their money. Now you think about that one. people and watching how their parents spend their time and spend their money. I love this quote by Abigail Van Buren. She says, the best index to a person's character is how he treats people who can't do him any good and how he treats people who can't fight back. Boy, isn't that the truth? I mean, like, you, you just want the short version, the Reader's Digest version of what a person's character is like. Watch how they treat people who can't do anything for them. Watch how they treat people who are in a position of weakness and who can't defend themselves. Watch how they treat people behind their backs. That'll tell you a lot about their character right there. I think about my own parents, and I, I feel so blessed to have had the parents that I did. I did not have perfect parents. None of us did, but I had good parents. And I think about my dad. My dad worked a lot when I was growing up. I mean, he just had to to keep food on the table. He worked uh, six days a week, and he worked really long days. He was a pharmacist who opened his own business, and he just had to work a zillion hours to just barely make a go of it there in the early years. But I think about the values that I learned from my parents, and, and you know, as a guy, we learn a lot from our dads, and, and the things that I learned from him. I was one of three boys, the middle one, and all three of us grew up working in the drugstore. And I can remember going through that rite of passage as a teenager working in the drugstore. And I mean, for just decades, 
So I just spent, saw my dad spend most of his hours doing, was working as the pharmacist. This was back in the day. He had a, he had a little mom and pop pharmacy on Main Street in downtown Brundage, Alabama. If you hadn't been to Brundage, you hadn't missed a lot, but he had the drugstore right there on Main Street, and it was in the days where you interacted with a pharmacist when you came in and got your stuff. So he, he interacted with people all day long. He filled scripts just you know, far closer than I am to you guys on the front row right here. And he would interact with the customers all day long. In three or four decades of him doing that, and all the years that I got to watch him do that, I can honestly say this. I cannot remember one time that I ever saw my dad be ugly to a customer or to an employee. I cannot recall one instance where he was short or, or um, sexually inappropriate or suggestive. I mean, just kind and consistent. And I can remember working with him and under him. and I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I'm just telling you the truth. I don't remember what the customer had done, but it, you know how as employees we, we'll sometimes do this. Somebody had come in and they had said or done something that was demanding or aggravating or whatever, and the customer left, and I was just mouthing off to another employee about this at the customer's expense. Of course, it's behind everybody's back. We're just, we're just rah, rah, rah about them and you know how stupid they were or, or whatever, and my dad heard it, and he stepped in and pulled me aside and I'll never forget what he said. It was just so simple. He said, you never forget this. We are here for two reasons and two reasons only. We are here to serve people and to make money. This is how we take care of our family. We're here to make money. But we do that by serving people. Don't be talking about our customers. And he walked on. I felt about this big and I needed to. I never forgot that. It was such a simple lesson. But... His words rang so true because he lived that. He lived to serve others. I, I think about some of the other values that, that I learned. You know, I said we learn from what we, how we see our parents treat other people and by how they spend their time and money. Now, watching my parents, they spent a lot of time working. And many of us are in that same bind. I mean where we're just, we're working, 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 just trying to pay the bills. And especially when I was little and dad was new in the business, they worked a lot, a lot of hours. But here's what really stood out to me. It is not that I somehow felt neglected or damaged because my dad worked a lot of hours. It's what my dad did with the hours that he wasn't working that really spoke to my heart the most and, and communicated values to me. Because when my dad was not at work, he was committing time to one of two other things. We were either in church or we were doing the family thing. As I said, Dad had to work six days a week and if you run your own pharmacy, you, you know, you gotta find fill-in pharmacists and that's expensive and he'd have to bring people in from an hour away to do that and so he didn't get to take a lot of time off but he, re he made sure that every year we took a family vacation that was at least a week long and about every four or five years we'd take a long family vacation that would be two or two and a half weeks long and, and we didn't have the money to like take extravagant vacations, what most people would think of as extravagant, but they would make them so good. Dad bought an, I remember an older used GMC pickup truck for about $4,000 and put just the real basic, just shell, just the camper shell on the top of the, the bed of that thing and we drove that sucker all over the country. We would camp to Wyoming and back, to the Tetons, to Yellowstone. We would camp into Canada, into Maine, go to, to New England, camp through the Finger Lake regions of, of New York and up and down the Appalachian Mountains. You know why we did that? We loved camping, but we camped because we didn't have the money to do otherwise. But you know what he was communicating in all of that? Not, not just the camping, but you know, he'd make sure that he would squeeze in a few weekends where he could take a three-day weekend during the year and we'd, we'd go to the beach or we'd go, we were, I lived hours away, so it was a treat like to come to Mobile. And we'd, we were boys doing the battleship was like you know, going to the North Pole or something. That was, that was so cool. But you know, the, the values that just saturated my soul in that, all of that told me that family really matters. Time invested with your family is so huge. And I think about how, how, you know, how parents spend money, how that 
so shapes our values. And so I would watch how my dad spent money, and, and three things stood out, and I realized that these became values for me. You know, the first thing that I think about in how my parents spent money is even through the leanest of times, it just was always such a big deal in my mind to see my parents always tithe. I can never, I'm not saying they never did, but I can never remember like them teaching me a lesson about tithing. You know, son, the tithe is 10% and this is how you do it before taxes or whatever. I don't remember them ever having a discussion with me about that stuff. I'll tell you what I do remember. I remember every Sunday morning of my life before we'd go to church, dad would never make a show of it, but he would come and sit down at his little bitty desk and he'd reach down in the drawer where everybody had... <clears throat> had their own box of offering envelopes and he would pull his out and he'd get out his checkbook and he'd write the tithe check and put it in. And nothing else had to be said because my older brother and I, we'd go, we'd, you know, it'd be like, you know, cool, we get to do what dad's doing. We'd get our envelope out and we'd put in our quarters and we'd get to write in our name and then check the boxes. Sunday school lesson read. <laughs> Attend us. Just some of you in the Baptist church know what I'm talking about. You got to get credit for everything you did that week, you know. It's almost like, did you brush your teeth? But, you know, we'd, we'd fill that out. And I, that just made such an impression that you always give. I, I don't remember him ever having to tell me to do that. And I don't ever remember a time in my life where I had to debate about whether or not to be a tither and a giver. Because I saw it modeled and it just was inherited as a value in my life that never went away. In terms of spending money, I look back and I realize that my parents invested a great deal I mean, based on what they made in my education. I've often wondered how in the world they afforded to do that, to invest what they did in, in an education. But that, I realized that that became a value for me, the importance of an education and making sure that my, my kids got that. And the, um, the final piece in that was just, I saw my, my parents, this doesn't sound terribly spiritual, but I'm just telling you, I saw them invest in family trips. I never flew on a commercial airplane until I got married. Uh, because we never had the money to do that kind of thing. But they, they invested what the little bit they had in creating experiences and memories that tied us tightly together as a family. And that taught me so much about family values. So my question to you is, your kids are, and your grandkids are watching how you treat other people. Not just to their faces, but behind their backs. Are they seeing you demonstrate kindness and compassion, acceptance, believing the best about others? Or do they see a, a harsh, biting, sarcastic, unkind, distrusting, prejudicial? What, what version of a person do they see in you? Because whether you like it or not, whether you want it to happen or not, they are absorbing their values about how to treat other people directly from you and me. Now, we can say whatever we want to about our values, but when you look at your day timer and your checkbook, what values are your kids learning about life from the way that you spend money and the way that you spend time? And what needs to be adjusted there? Third and final thing. Jesus grew in favor with God. What an intriguing way to put that. It's like a, another way of saying, God just liked Jesus better and better the longer he lived. You know, he grew in favor with God. But more literally, Jesus became increasingly pleasing to God in the way that he lived his life. As he grew up, he learned to live a life that just got better and better in terms of how he honored and pleased God and how he loved the Father. And Jesus taught us that this is the single greatest thing we ever learned to do. When asked, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing? Jesus had a ready response. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Parents, grandparents, of all the things that we'll teach our kids to do, the most important is to teach them to love Jesus, to follow Jesus, to live to please him. How on earth do you do that? Well...
and chasing after Jesus. Just two simple things that I'm going to say and we're wrapped up. First, in doing that, God's Word has to be our primary textbook in training our kids for life. We don't need them to have some vague notion of what God is like or how we live in a relationship with Him. The written Word of God becomes the defining standard for knowing the true God. And here's what God said through Moses to his people about this. Now at that time, they only had the first little portion. But what I'm about to read applies to the whole thing. He said, write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talking about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Parents, remember this. It's not the church's job to disciple your kids. We, we just back you up in that. We support you in that. Every one of us who are parents, it is our job to disciple our kids, to teach them the Word of God, to teach them who Christ is. He says, you can't talk about it enough from the time you get up until you go to bed at night. That, that used to be one of the sweetest times every night going to bed with our kids is the last part of the day. We'd lay down, I'd lay down with the girls, and we had this deal that we would always do. Take just a little bit of time to talk. You say your prayers, and I just did, once again, family values passed along. I did what my grandmother would do with me every time she'd come and spend the night with us, and she'd lay down with us, and we'd practice saying memory verses. And so I would do that with the girls. Lindsay's back here, and she, she can attest to that. Countless nights that we'd lay down and we'd practice doing memory verses and I was a sucker. L Lindsay was always, she'd learn how to manipulate that. She figured out that if she would draw on my back with her finger when we were doing that, that I would be snoring pretty soon. And so that, that would be like her, her method of keeping me in bed longer than I planned to be was if she'd draw on my back, I'd be out soon. But until I conked out, we'd pray and do memory verses. And here's the cool thing that would come out of those conversations with Whitney and Lindsay is all of the questions and really meaningful dialogues, things that we'd pray about that they would then ask good questions about. Some of them questions that the, the dad going to seminary would be like, I don't know the answer to that. But we'd chew on that kind of stuff and wrestle with that stuff. And at the heart of that was learning who God is and finding a faith in him that mattered. The word of God has to be central. Finding times to instill that in our kids. Maybe your practice is to to spend just a, just a moment just having a devotional time with the kids and saying a, just a, a brief prayer with them before they go to school in the morning. Maybe at bedtime, just going to pray over your kids and interact with them at, at bedtime. Finding times to talk to your kids. Hey, Sunday's a great time. If you've got kids that are in the children's time, hey, they're not just playing games. They're being taught the Word of God. Talk to them about that when you go home. Interact with them about that. Talk to them about what you hear and hear. But keeping God's Word... Uh, central and then the final piece is children need parents to help them make a lasting connection to God's family through the local church kids the day coming hey I've done student ministry enough years and I've, I've worked with families enough years to know what's normal when kids are little, if you'll get them plugged in in church where there are other kids, they're going to like it and they're going to be happy. They get a little bit older and they get to be teenagers and they get real finicky about church, don't they? A, a lot of them are like, I don't want to go there. I don't like that. It's stupid. It, it just, it's such a typical thing in teen culture. And I am blown away by the numbers of parents that will jump from church to church because their kids got unhappy. Well, my friends are over here and my friends don't go there anymore. Hey, that's a great opportunity for us to teach our kids. Church isn't about chasing your friends. Church is about you growing in a relationship with God, but church is also about family. And we don't just run you know, from family to family to family, just leaving people behind. It's the family where we plug in. It's the place where we give back. And if church ain't great, then we need to make it better. If children's ministry isn't exciting, then we need to help make a better children's ministry. If student ministry doesn't just make you want to go, woohoo, it's Wednesday night or it's Sunday afternoon, then let's figure out what we can do to add something back and make it better. We live in a time where church isn't so cool. And there's a growing trend of people who have 
been in church just drifting away and finding their own way to do church. We still need Christian community and we need to communicate that value to our kids. And it doesn't do that, parents. It doesn't do that by saying when our kids are teenagers, well, I don't want to make them go to church when they don't want to and then leave a bad taste in their mouth so that when they're 18 and 20 and 22, that they resent that and then don't go to church. That plan doesn't work. The whole thing of saying, well, they didn't want to when they were 14 or when they were 15, so I didn't make them go with the hope being that they'd fall in love with church again when they were 19. That's a bad plan. It's just like learning to eat right. We're going to consistently do the healthy thing. We're going to be in church, and we're not just talking about in here on Sunday morning. This isn't connection. This is the beginning point. Connection is really getting involved. It's finding a place to belong. It's being in a small group. It's finding a place to serve. We're going to be connected as a family. And we're going to stay committed. And we're going to make sure that you do that for 18 years. May not be able to control that during your college years. But I'm going to trust that you experiencing healthy Christian community for 18 years is going to have a much better chance of keeping you connected long term than this hit or miss stuff of will you only go if you want to go. There's a lot to being a parent, isn't there? It's a big challenge, and we've got to keep our eyes on the prize. There are a lot of different parts to this. Moms, we honor you today. The stuff that we talked about, oh, you play a big role in this. Helping our kids grow up physically, helping them develop real wisdom, helping them learn to trust and follow Jesus. I want to pray for you and for all of you listening online today. Before we go, would you, would you bow together and would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for the incredible gift of belonging to your family. It is so comforting and good to know that you are our Father. Some of us have had great parents. Some of us have had not so great parents. Some of us have still got them. And some of us today grieve because parents have passed. We pray that you comfort those. We give you thanks for our parents. We thank you for being the perfect example and being a loving Father. Lord, would you pour out on us what we need to love and shepherd and care for our kids the way that we need to. Please forgive us for all the ways that we've screwed up. Please help our kids to overcome that. Please help them to get past all the goofy things that we've said and done that they didn't need to see. And starting now, would you help us to be men and women of faith, godly character, would you help us to model for them lives where we take care of ourselves, where we chase hard after you, where we live with godly values and real integrity? And may you give us the grace to pass those values and that kind of lifestyle on to our kids. And we pray these things with simple faith in you, Lord Jesus, as we pray in your name. Amen.